most artists don't get one debut, let alone two, from her first uh, collaborations with Jim Jarmusch uh, to her own work as a filmmaker uh, and her own cinema miracle. Uh, the coolest person I know, Sarah Driver, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> when you were growing up in New Jersey, did you spend much time in New York? My dad commuted to the city, so I lived under the shadow of the city, and I always knew that I was going to live in New York. And, um, and my mother had this theory that I would learn French if she took me to the New Wave films. So she used to take me to the Carnegie Cinema on 57th Street and 7th Avenue, which is no longer there. And I, she'd leave me there, and then she'd go have business meetings, and I'd be watching these. I was like eight or nine years old, and there was all these like sexual innuendos and stuff, and I didn't know what was going on. I was much more interested in those than the language. <laughs> <laughs> what were you learning? Yes, yeah, yeah. it's like yeah, you know, be careful what you wish for. And you know, so I, and so I was very lucky. I was I would I you know I think film is the culmination of all the arts. It's the culmination of dance, of music, of theater, of every art, paintings, everything, and I, and having grown up here, you know, outside of the city, I really had access to all of that. What was the, the scene like, the scene, you know, the East Village, CBGB, the music, the filmmakers, Amos Poe, you know, Beth B, there was a whole seeming, like a petri dish of great art and great communication about art. What was that like? Do you recall that? Yeah, I mean, what was, it was a petri dish. I mean, my friend Carla McCormick did a, a um, a show at the Gray Museum at the NYU, right. the Gray Gallery, uh, about two years ago, and he had all of, all the different artists who had been er, lurking around then, f from like 1975 to 1985, and it was amazing how many different art forms were ger were germinating each other and helping each other. Where musicians were in movies, and you know, and 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 filmmakers were picking up guitars and. There were painters who were also making films, and everybody was helping each other with everybody's project. Yeah. And, um, and it was also a period, you know, it was punk, so it was sort of like anybody could pick up a guitar and play it, even if it just sounded like noise. It was, you really didn't, you didn't have any limitations. You didn't really think in terms of, you know, having to be the very best at something. It was more about energy and just trying to experiment. And if you made a mistake, so fuck it, you know? And that's how you learn, is through mis mistakes. Why didn't film follow a similar course out of that scene that music did. This film seemed to be more about a certain aesthetic, which I guess will lead us to You Are Not I. What was the aesthetic of film at the time? Well, I think we were all trying to tell stories in new ways, and some of us were more scene-oriented in our filmmaking, and others, like You Are Not I, it's not a scene movie at all, but it has people who were involved with the scene yeah. in it. Right. We were all very in influenced by European filmmaking. Yeah. And um, which we had a lot of access to. And if you want to make films, I think the best way to, make, to know about making films is to go to the movies and see them in the movie theater. So really, that's how we learned how to make movies. Say that again, though, the movie theater. The movie theater, not on DVD. Let's talk about you and I. When did you first read the, the source material? And, and when did that click that this is something I want to make as a piece of cinema? Well, I, 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 I went through a period you couldn't get Paul Bowles' books. Paul Bowles was one of the beats. You know, he was friends with Burroughs, and I just thought he was amazing. And you couldn't really get his books here. And, and finally, a company called Black Sparrow Press started putting out his books in the late 70s, and I, and I was gobbling them up. And, I, and this, You Are Not I, was in a story of his collected works, and it's a seven-page story. And I remember sitting on my bed going, what happened? Mm -hmm. What? What was that twist? And then I thought, I've got to direct a film exactly as I first read it, without being analytical or anything. And, um, and then I, Jim and I wrote the screenplay together, which was very, very close adaptation of the story. And, and then we went ahead and shot it. And I didn't have the rights or anything. And, but I had access to William Burroughs, because my friend Howard Bruckner was making a documentary about William Burroughs. And Burroughs gave me the address to Paul Bowles, and I wrote to Paul Bowles, and I said, I made this film, and I, I don't, I, I'd really like the rights. <laughs> and, um, don't sue me. <laughs> and, well, I didn't care if anybody sued me, because, which was, in the New York Times, they said it was, I, I was afraid of being sued. Well, I didn't own anything, so I, that was the last thing I was thinking about. <laughs> you can't get blood from a stone. No, you can't. You know, I was picking up, you know, furniture on the street on Tuesday nights, which was garbage night then, where you get 
It's really good furniture. <laughs> the Home Shopping street. Network yeah, of the yeah. early 80s. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I used to see Louise Nevelson, the, the sculptor, out on the street picking up furniture, too. Oh, amazing. And, um, um, and Paul Bowles wrote me, and he said, you have to talk to my agent at William Morris. I can't give you the rights, but it sounds intriguing. So I showed the film to the agent at William Morris, and he gave me all the rights. And he said, if I had made the if I had come with just a screenplay and wanting to make the rights, he wouldn't have given me the rights. Hmm. So it was one of those funny things where it just worked out. And then the film, all the materials for You Are Not I were lost in around 1998. And they were all in a storage facility in New Jersey, and they were lost. And Jim and I were devastated. We had one festival print. I made a one-inch master of, from that festival print onto video. And I discovered about three years ago that the signal had disappeared on that, that that no longer existed. And then I got a phone call in the beginning of the summer of 2010 from this archivist who was archiving all Paul Bowles' letters and materials. And he said, we found a pristine print of your film in Paul, among Paul Bowles' collection. So I, it was just a, an amazing event. Some filmmakers don't want to look at their own work, let alone a film that they thought was kind of left for the, the, the ether of the world. Uh, what was it like seeing it again? I noticed the f one foot moving among the dead people, which I never noticed before. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a filmmaker. <laughs> Damn them. <laughs> I, I, is, that, is that your metier, or is that your, your trend to watch your films? Do you, do you ever have any resistance to watching your films? Um, you know, it was almost like seeing someone else's work after all these years. Because you had changed, obviously. I mean, that's yeah, I just didn't. It, it, it was, enjoy, you know, it was, it was a strange and spooky experience. <laughs> <laughs> I like that voice. I, I'm scared. Um, well, it's funny because I, I think, you know, by and large, films change for us as we get older as human beings. We remember things differently. Right. Did you? Rem did anything surprise you about the film? I, d I don't feel that associated with it. I, I feel more clinical or something. Like thinking back of how we did it, and I remember, and Suzanne reminded me because she came in for the New York Film Festival, the lead actress, and because someone's, because she's so focused in the film, and she said, "Oh yeah, Sarah kept me separate, and I had forgotten that that I had kept her separate from everyone else in the film during the six days we shot that film in six days." Can you still make movies that way, I guess? I mean, I think you're right in terms of architecturally, it's a great way to make movie. Are we too emotional? I mean, we, are we kind of, where are we now with making a movie that way? Can you make a movie with experienced people that way, or is that just a product of where you I guys think, were? I think, you know, I think there's some really great, interesting, like those red, red bucket kids that like, um, the uh, pleasures of being robbed and um, that have been shown now at Cannes and stuff, and they made their movies for like twenty, thirty thousand yeah. dollars. I think, I think, and they shot on film. Yeah. And um, um, I think you know, if you have a story to tell, you'll use the limitations. I mean, Stranger is a total act of limitation. We didn't have any money, you know, and we didn't have time. We couldn't do cutaways. Jim had to design the film so every scene is one shot. And that's the only way, the whole film was shot in 18 days. So, I mean, I think limitations can actually give a poetry to something. So I'm thinking of these young film artists at Cannes. For, uh, I think Jim once said 10 days, which was eight days too long. Um, what was that like for you? Do you recall it specifically? It was like being in a Fellini film. And it was, um, we, didn't ha you know, we didn't have any money to, we stayed in this apartment where um, the producer and his girlfriend slept in the living room, and Jim and I slept in this other room that was like had a hammock bed kind of. And then th there was no water one day, and he had to be interviewed by French television. So he was shaving with tea. <laughs> and, and then I remember we went to this very fancy, elegant party of uh, Frederick Mar Mitterrand. And, <laughs> and Mitterrand was the, president, was the president of the country at the time. Right. And um, Frederick Mitterrand is a big cinephile. He still has a, like a film, TV show, um, talk show. And, um, and we went to this chateau. And we didn't bring any clothes. We didn't know anything, you know? So, and all these very elegant <laughs> French people were like shaking our hands going, oh, we like your outfits. Like they clearly didn't, you know? <laughs> and, then they, and then they sat us at like a children's table. Like they kind of kept us away from everybody else. And I was, and Chantal Ackerman was there. Right. And I wonder if Chantal remembers this, because Chantal, I remember, turned to me and she went, sorry, who's that terrifying looking woman over there? And I said, that's Melina McCurry. She went, oh! <laughs> 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 it was then the, the head of 
culture in Greece. Amazing. And um, she was on a film called Never on Sunday, which she was, I think she won an Oscar for that. She Amazing. was a very thin woman. Um, and um, so it, it was really mind blowing. And then when the film got a prize, because it won the camera door, yeah. they wouldn't let us into the main theater because we weren't dressed. <laughs> No. And so they had to come out, they, the guy who, from, who ran that section of the festival had to beg these guards to let us uh, in. How do you feel about your life as a filmmaker now? I mean, do you call yourself a filmmaker? Do, does one have to call oneself a, a filmmaker to make films? I mean, how do you look at yourself now? Well, I've been on a, a, you know, it's a very, it's, unfortunately, bankers and lawyers took over the film industry in the 90s. And, you know, I remember seeing Betty, uh, Betty Davis on David Frost show and she said all the great producers were gamblers and there's none of them left <laughs> and it's true there's you know we don't have the gamblers we have people who are trying to make charts and figure out how much something's going to make and this whole celebrity thing where you have to even if you want 500,000 to make a film you have to get like a top celebrity involved I mean it's you know it, I feel like there's all these people walking around going now you know, um, we have this suit and we want you to put this actor in it instead of you get the actor and then you put the suit on the actor. You know, you don't, everything seems a little topsy-turvy. One still has to believe that that's the end game. Uh, despite, as you say, all the complexities and interests, make the best film you can. Make the best film you can, exactly. You try, you know.